Okay, uh, welcome everybody to uh, this CTLP Spring Institute uh, session. Um, I'm Jonathan Graves. I'm your host for this morning, evening, wherever you are, if you're not here in person. Um, so we're going to be talking today about uh, how to create interactive computational learning experiences, uh, learning uh, Jupiter. So uh, basically our sort of goal for today is to go over sort of briefly the structure and kind of the framework for what we're talking about here. Um, that should only take about 15 to 20 minutes, I think. Um, I have done other sessions and there's some more information um, online, for example, on my website about some of the bigger picture reasons why you might want to use this technology. But we're going to focus more on the, the creating aspect of this. Um, so, just a couple logistical things. If at any point you have a question, um, feel free to raise your hand, either physically or using the raise hand feature uh, in the room here. You can um, type a question into the chat. We have um, one of my very talented RAs from my, um, one of the projects where we're actually building some of these notebooks. Uh, Priyanshu, if you want to say hi. Uh, <laughs> Branchu will be here if you're in the online session and you have any like weird technical problems that you can't immediately short out or sort out rather. Um, Branchu can kind of give you a hand, move you into a breakout room really quickly and then uh, get that sorted out. So hopefully that won't happen, but we're there to, he's there to, to help us out as we go through this session. Um, any questions before we get started here? All good? Um, okay, so just to be aware, um, we have a bit of an experimental camera setup. I mentioned this before. So we have a, um, it's called the OWL here. Um, it's an adaptive camera system. So as people talk in the room, it will kind of move around and adapt. So you can kind of see me here. I'm in the bottom corner and then we've got Ainsley and Josephine. So we should all be able to take part. Okay, so let's get started. Um, right, so why, like big picture, why would you want to use this tech, these tools or this technique? What's sort of like the pedagogical and curricular fit for it? Um, it's really flexible. So first of all, so I'm just going to use some common examples of situations where I think it's particularly useful. But I think, you know, really, as hopefully you'll learn by the end of this session, the sky is really the limit in terms of what you can do with this. It's, it's really how creative can you get? Um, but some of the common things are... Uh, the idea of data is really important to lots of different disciplines, but data always has this problem where it's really, really abstract. You know, you're talking about like the distribution of wages in Canada or, or something. And that's not, that's kind of hard to grasp what we're talking about, particularly when students are still building, you know, their intuition for some of these statistical, mathematical, or, you know, scientific concepts. Um, but often you want to show them like these cool patterns and things like that, or you need to teach them how to do different kinds of coding, maybe, you know, basic coding operations to do analysis or computer programming or, or whatever, um, or you want to demonstrate a new theoretical technique, like an algorithm or something. The problem with lots of these is that, you know, these are major learning contexts in pretty much any course that deals with data or the systems that manage data or talks about the social implications of data. So it covers, you know, many fields in the, in the sciences, social sciences, even the humanities. Um, this is way harder than it kind of should be um, when you actually take it into the classroom because there's a bunch of sort of like, like, non-pedagogical problems that interfere with doing something that should be, you know, it seems like a relatively straightforward thing to do. The first one, and probably the most obvious one, is your st students need computers. Um, George had the great question, it's like, what software do I need to install? Your students have to have the right software installed on those computers. They also need to know how to use the software, or maybe even code in it if that's something that they need to do. Um, you also need to have some way to share all of these materials with the students as well. All of these cause problems. If you ever like tried to get students to install, I don't know, Python on 200 computers, it's a nightmare. Our students are really good at, you know, using cell phones and iPads and stuff like that. But a lot of them, even ones who are fairly tech savvy in the utilization dimension are actually basically completely tech illiterate when it comes to computation using like the idea that there's a directory and things go in it and stuff like that is often a foreign concept to many of our students. There's also an equity issue at play in many cases, because if you're trying to demonstrate, say, a fairly high powered computational technique, you need a computer that can run it. 
many students, particularly students from disadvantaged backgrounds, will come to UBC and they might have, you know, only a pretty basic laptop. And you'd be like, oh, you need to install all this stuff, and it just won't happen. I've actually worked with students whose senior PCs were basically limited or restricted because their computers weren't good and they couldn't afford another one. We couldn't find any sort of solutions that would solve these problems. So there's other dimensions that this kind of intersects with. As I mentioned, I've talked about this before in other sessions. You can find some of my presentations on the website if you're interested in sort of the bigger picture here. But let's talk about the solutions instead. So in particular, what I want to sort of talk about is I want to talk, there's, there's more solutions than this. These are all major points of failure. There's lots of approaches to sort of solving this. Um, I'm going to share with you today the Jupiter-based approach. Um, and so what is this? Why would we do it? And how does it kind of operate? So rather than going into like the details of all this, I'm going to give you kind of like a hands-on example from my practice. Um, so we've been working for the last year on a project to try to integrate the and the system into basically all of our undergraduate uh, econometrics courses, which is a branch of applied statistics. So I'm just going to kind of show you what these look like when we, you know, put this all together really quickly. So I'll drop this link into the chat here. If you are playing along at home. Um, so this is our web page for our Comet project here. We have a, uh, a large repository that keeps track of basically all of our statistics. Things. It's currently a work in progress. We're in the middle of a big cleanup right now for, for year two. Um, but I'll try to show you what you end up getting out of these, these notebooks at the end. So I'm just going to go here under basics. Uh, if you're following along, I'll go to the preliminary material. I'm just going to go down to this introduction to Jupyter notebooks page because it's kind of basic. Um, so this is what like the final, final output of a notebook looks like. This isn't the interactive version. I'll show you this in a, in a little while, but this shows you basically the structure of what you end up getting from these. And what they are is they're a way to basically, they're, they're based on what's called the computational, or sorry, literate com computation framework or literate computing framework. And what they do is they allow you to weave together different forms of content. So for example, you can see here at the top, we've got you know, a nice title for our notebook. Um, so this is introduction to Jupyter notebooks here. We've got some information about the authorship. So my highly talented RA Attica worked on this and then I regret it mostly. <laughs> um, and then we've got, you know, you can write these in different ways. So for instance, um, we have sort of a standard structure we use for these because we use these in classrooms. They have sort of like a, an outline for the material. So what students will learn when they go through and they use these particular notebooks. Um, we also have, you know, references and readings. Um, when we get into them, you can have, as you can see here, there's lots of text that kind of talks about, you know, what the notebook is or introduces the theoretical concept or whatever it is you want to do. Um, and we, this is sort of an orientation here. And then you can, you know, you can define things, you can look through them, and then it starts walking you through actually how these things interact. So this is kind of what you end up getting when you go through the whole process of putting together a notebook is you get a package that looks like this, but the key benefit of the Jupyter framework is not that it generates, you know, HTML output like this, but rather that this is interactive. Um, so in order to make it interactive, you need to launch it on a Jupyter Hub. So if you do want some inspiration, you can ch check out um, on the, the, the accompanying document for this one. I have a list of different teaching resources people have built here at UBC that cover lots of different use cases. This is one of them. So like you can see, we've got, for instance, like a bunch of examples of ones where like, you know, we teach, I don't know, basic central tendency and stuff like that. Um, but let's show you the sort of in-action side of things um, just to get started here. So let me go back here. Sorry, I'm looking at a different screen. So there's lots of ways you can develop notebooks, and you'll kind of get the flavor when we actually start building one. Um, you can use them as demonstrations when they're really highly sort of hands-off. For instance, we've worked with um, the Center for Computational Social Science and Sociology for basically people with no coding no programming or expertise, or it's really just like push buttons, make graphs show up, manipulate the graphs with a few different like basic things. That's really great. You can use them as 
projects. So you can write tests or you know homework assignments based around these. That's something you can do. Um, you can like I just showed you, you can make a website out of it. So students, even if they don't have an internet connection, they can just or uh, don't even if they're not programming along, they can read along and use it as a reference. There's lots of different ways you can do it. I think there's, you know, it's ultimately about your teaching context. So, okay, that's the preamble. Any questions before we kind of go further here? So what I'm gonna do in this session, so it's the 15 minute introduction I told you. So um, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you how we can use uh, Jupyter here at UBC. Uh, and then I'm gonna show you some of the basics of building notebooks uh, using the tools that are pretty readily available at UBC. Um, so this includes making your very first notebook, some tips on basic markdown, which you probably already know, but if you don't, it's really easy to learn. Um, writing executable code, different kinds of embeds or images. Um, and then I'll show you some suggestions perhaps for assessment or more advanced use, which you can adapt and kind of go around. And then we can just kind of do a, a Q and A. Um, so that's the goal. Um, so hopefully by the end of this session, what you'll be sort of able to do is you'll be able to create a basic Jupyter notebook on uh, UBC's Jupyter Open Platform or pretty much any other platform that exists because they're all pretty standardized. Um, you'll be able to write markdown content in your notebook, which is cool because it looks nice and students can interact with it. You can create code cells and run them, understand kind of what they're doing. Um, you'll be able to see how interactivity works in notebooks and hopefully be able to write a basic self-test. And then I'll discuss some of the different deployment options you have for uh, sharing with students. Um, okay, so let's get going with the hands-on side of things. Okay, the very first thing you kind of need to be aware of is there are lots of different options for using Jupyter. Jupyter is a system. Um, it can be installed on your computer. That's one option. You can do it. That's called a local installation of Jupyter. The more useful way to do it is to run it via what's called a Jupyter hub, which is where the main sort of server that runs all the platform is installed somewhere else. For example, um, here at UBC, we have this tool, which is UBC's uh, Jupyter Open system. So Jupyter Open is called a Jupyter hub. And what it is, is basically a hosting repository that you can connect to using a web browser that gives you access to the Jupyter Notebooks framework and IDE and a bunch of different hurdles. Um, we actually have two frameworks here, which we can talk a little bit more about when it comes to assessment. Jupyter Open is sort of the general purpose one, which is probably the one that when you're getting started, you wanna use, and it's probably the one that you'll use in most courses. But if you have really specific uh, like use cases for what you wanna do with your computational tools, like for example, you have really big data, like GIS data uh, or image data, something that there's a lot of information that needs to get processed you may want a course specific hub um, just because standard hub is for everybody. If yours is really demanding, you may need to set them up instead. Um, the other one could be if you want, you know, uh, a really tight integration with Canvas, like where it can push, push and pull things into Canvas, um, course specific hubs are more general for that. There are also a bunch of backup options. So as I said, the Jupyter Hub framework is all open source. It's, developed by the Jupyter organization. And so, for example, there is a non-UBC hub, which um, is still hosted and is you log in with your CWL, which is through, uh, it's called Syzygy. It's hosted by the Pacific Institute for Mathematical Sciences. Um, there's even one, if you absolutely don't want to log in with anything, this can access it just completely on your own. But let me show you the, the UBC Jupyter Open one instead. This is probably the... Okay, I'm going to drop this into the chat here. You're following along, or you can just Google UBC Jupyter Open. One sec here. Chat, please, I beg of you. Okay. Yes, so Syzygy is not, it's not UBC's Syzygy, it's Syzygy set up a hub for UBC students. So it's still hosted by the Pacific Institute for Mathematical Sciences. Yeah, you can log on through that as well. Um, there's There are reasons to use 
uh, UBC's Jupiter Open over uh, Syzygy or another hub. The main reason is that it's hosted here at UBC, so it's on UBC, you know, privacy compliant computers. It's also supported, as you can see in the tech guide here, uh, it's supported by UBC's uh, very capable, um, actually just next door here, um, UBC's very capable LT team. So if something goes terribly wrong, you're not literally relying on Tim over in the math department to fix your hub, <laughs> which is what Tim's does. Tim is awesome, but like there's one guy and if he's on vacation, you're in trouble. Um, so this is this is sort of the maybe the better option. This, this is also kind of um, a little bit stronger. Here, I'll, I'll post it again in the chat. So if you go to this page here and you scroll down a little bit, you can see it on my screen here. Um, this is the instructor guide. So they've got a bunch of information here, but the login is through this, this button here. So if you click on this button, um, it'll launch the hub. If I already logged in, it'll probably prompt you to um, log in with your CWL. And after a little bit, it'll load up something that looks kind of like this. I'll just wait here. So just again, when you're on this page here, when you're on this page here, just scroll down and then click on the login via Jupyter Open. Um, it'll prompt you to log in with your CWL, and then you'll probably see a little loading bar will go across your screen. What's there is it's spawning um, a, a, a connection to the hub for you, and then you should get a, something that looks like this. This is the point where I need to make sure I have my guide so I don't forget to do things. Oh, George just dropped. Can you add him back? Everybody A okay? Anybody need a hand? You can also ping Prianchu if you are if you get stuck. Um, I will also mention that there is, um, I'll put a link in the chat. I'll drop a link in the chat. Um, all the slides and all the material, I have sort of like a cheat sheet guide, which I just handed out into the in-person people here, um, which you can access through this PDF here if you get stuck or you want something for later on. But we'll go through everything on its own here. Okay, I'm just gonna go back. This is very confusing the moment there. Okay, All right. Um, so what are we looking at here? Let's let's sort of orient ourselves to this. So once you've connected to the Jupiter Hub, what we're at, what we what this launches into is it launches into a basic editor. Um, the editor is called Jupiter Lab. Um, I'm not going to focus too much on all the features of Jupiter Lab for a very simple reason, and that this isn't the only way to create Jupyter notebooks. In fact, there are dozens of different alternative software, some of which you might like more. The nice thing about this one is it's kind of what you see is what you get. So the output you're getting you produce in this one is exactly what the students are going to see when you share with them the notebook and they access it via their hub as well. So that's one reason to kind of you know, build stuff in this, although you can get more sophisticated as you go a little bit further. But let's kind of get into it. So when you connect to the hub, it'll spawn the Jupyter Lab environment, which looks like this. Um, and this is basically kind of like the workspace, kind of like Microsoft Word's like homepage when it opens up. Um, so in the center here, this is kind of like the quick launch menu. It's called the launcher. I mean, you see it's got a lot of different sort of buttons here. Um, these are all at the top here. These are all um, where you can create or launch new notebooks. Um, so what are all these different versions here? Um, these are all the different computational environments. They're called kernels. So when I say kernel, what I mean is a computational environment that runs a particular kind of software. So you can see here, this one here is the Python 3 kernel. So if you wanted to make a notebook um, it, that was going to run Python code, you would use this one. If you wanted to make one that was going to run C++ version 14, you would make this one, Java, R, Julia, SageMath. There's, there's a bunch. Um, and in fact, there are even more than this. This is just the standard kernels that are installed on UBC's Jupyter Open Hub. Um, th does that make sense? So when you create a notebook, it launches a particular, basically, language. Um, OK. So that's kind of like where you would create them. There's also some other options where if you want to, you know, just launch a console to do basic computation without having a notebook, but these are the main ones you tend to work with because the, the selling point of Jupyter is the, the notebook. Um, let's just look over here on the sidebar really quickly. This is actually kind of the important part. Um, so if you look at the top here, you might not have it. It might've been hidden. This little folder is the directory. It's your home directory on this particular server. 
So on your computer, right, you're accessing this through a web browser. You've connected to UBC's Jupyter Open server here. Um, and so these are all the different files. You might not have any right now that are currently on your particular, um, your particular server. So you can see I've got a bunch of folders because I've been using this for a while, but this is kind of where things would go. You can right click or the Mac equivalent or Linux equivalent control click on this to, for example, just create new notebooks, or you can click on existing ones here to open up a pretty standard context menu, like renaming, deleting, stuff like that. So just think of this as being like the file directory or file manager. Yes, Josephine. I see your memory thing at the bottom. I don't see one on mine, and I was curious, how do you know like, what sort of the basic, basic memory allocation you have? Let me just take a quick look-see at your... Like I have nothing on there, but how do I know like as soon as I have like a CWA, I'm without some kind of resources. Yeah. I have some files, but how do I I have, I have two two thousand forty-eight megabytes? Yeah, so you might be in the um it depends a little bit. You may be in so let me just show you. Um you can tweak the settings for this if you look at the top menu. So the question was, um, I don't know how much memory I have. I mean, it should show up when you're in the notebook. It'll show you the kernel utilization here. Um, everyone has the same amount. So you see you have two gigs as standard. Um, you can tweak what's shown in the, if you go up to settings at the top, you can adjust the, the theme. You can add different things. So for example, um, you can see there's like dark mode, for instance. Ooh, <laughs> dark mode is not good for presentations, but you may like dark mode. You can increase the font size and stuff. So under settings, there's really a bunch of like pretty standard uh, visualization settings for what this looks like here. So things like this. Um, let me show you a couple other ones here. Okay, so file menu is this top one here. I'll also just mention at the top bar in the file menu, there's a very important button, which is create a new folder. Yeah. Uh, there's also a, this upload file. This is how you move files from your own computer into your Jupyter Lab account or Jupyter Hub account. So if you wanted to upload, we'll actually do this in a little bit. This is where you would do this. Um, this is like refreshing the file browser if something like isn't showing up that you think should be there. That's how you would refresh it. Um, yeah. uh, it has a bunch of Git integrations, which we won't talk about too much today, mostly for time reasons, although I'll briefly mention kind of the approach here. So this is like if you have stuff on GitHub, you can load from GitHub directly, or if you just have stuff on regular Git, this is where it kind of shows up here. Um, we won't talk about too much today, but if you, you know Git, you know it. This guy's important though. So this little sort of weird circle, I don't know why they have weird esoteric symbols. This is the kernel browser or kernel indicator. So as I said, when you are on the hub, you launch notebooks into different computational environments running different languages. These are referred to as kernels. Um, and you can start and shut down them and you can see what you currently have running basically in your account here. So if you, you know, it tries to persist your stuff across settings, but sometimes you might not want this kernel still active. Um, so you can like, for instance, shut them down from here. I'm gonna shut down my kernels because I don't need them open right now. So this is where you can kind of manage and get a big picture indicator of where your, your kernel kernels are working. If you have a bunch of files open. Um, this guy's pretty straightforward. It's a table of contents when you're in a notebook. So you can kind of jump around between headings, which is nice. Um, and this one you shouldn't play with, but if you have it on your local thing, you can add extensions to Jupyter Lab, which extend its functionality. Um, this is something that has to be done on the hub. So this is currently what we have available here. So you can see like, we have something for creating LaTeX and stuff, but we'll look at there. Okay, I think that's about it. Um, the only other ones that I wanna mention is just a couple of brief ones in the, in the menu thing up here. Good old file menu which in particular has stuff like exporting, but we'll get to this. This is where you like save, export, download, things like that. Um, the run menu is where you can run different cells um, in particular in different ways. And the kernel menu here is another way of accessing this little circle menu with a few more options. So you can like restart, rerun, do stuff like this. But let's see it in practice. It's it's one of the, I think with all like tools, it's better to just kind of use them and then get familiar and kind of figure out where things are as opposed to trying to learn like all the different menus. But I think it's fairly, oh, there's also a pretty good help menu and there's tons of like good videos online. So you can like add different help things. 
Okay, so let's make our first notebook. Um, that sounds like fun. Let's let's do that. Let me make sure I have my my sheet here so I can remember what I want to do. But so to create a new notebook, um, we're it's actually fairly straightforward. Basically, what we want to do is we we click on the environment or the framework that you are interested in. So I'm going to demonstrate using R, Y, R because I'm most comfortable with it and it's the one that I know the best. So I'm less likely to make a mistake. But if you want to play around or experiment with, for example, the Python one, that's probably fine too. Um, but if you want to follow along very closely, R is probably your best, best bet. The two most well supported in the sense that like there's the largest community around them are uh, R, Python, and then Julia, but there are a bunch of different ones. So for example, SageMap is like a math specific kernel that's very, very well supported as well. So if you want to do like symbolic algebra or something, which is actually really helpful for demonstrating like complex factorizations in math. But anyway, let's get to it. Um, so to, to make a new notebook, I just click on the R menu here and it's going to create it. You'll, you'll notice over here on the little, if I open up this, if I look at the file menu, um, you can see I've created the new notebook. It's it's over here. And it comes up with a terrible name. It just loads as an untitled. So of course, to rename it, what I would do is I would just right click on this guy in the menu here. And I'm going to call it, I don't know, example. And now you can see the, the name changed here. Um, let me just point out a couple of things that's kind of important to pay attention to when you're working in a notebook. So this is like, you can see the launcher is no longer here. Um, it's now been in place with the notebook view. And at the top, we've got a bunch of different buttons. These run different elements. So I'll show you these in just a second. Um, one thing to just pay attention to is this little sort of circle on the side. This is the kernel information for this specific notebook. Um, so you can see here, this notebook is connected to the, it's, it's on the R kernel. So what this means is that all the code cells in this will be evaluated using the R language or the R interpreter. Um, and this little indicator here, this circle is the kernel status indicator. So if you hover over it, it'll tell you what's happening right now. But basically white means I'm connected and ready to go. Black, like filled black or gray means I'm running something, please wait. Um, and anything else means you have a problem. <laughs> in particular, a bomb means your kernel crashed but a bomb, yes. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so notebooks are composed as, as, as a, a series of cells. This is like the basic building block of a notebook. Um, and cells are basically just little content units. Um, you can organize them differently, but you can see here we've actually, it loads up with one cell initially. So if I click into this, this cell here, um, you'll notice my cursor's gone in here and it's highlighted the cell to show that I'm editing it. Um, standard Jupyter Notebooks have three types of cells. Um, we can see the different types of cells if we go up to this little bar up the top here. Um, it says select the cell type. This also changes it. So if I click on this, you can see right now this is a what's called a code cell. Um, there's also a markdown cell and a raw cell. So what's a code cell? A code cell is something where when this cell is executed or run, we'll execute or run the code within that cell. We'll, we'll come back to this in a little bit. Um, the other type, which is called markdown, is a cell that when this cell is executed or run, it processes this the text in it as what's called markdown text. And we'll go through an introduction to this as well. Raw cells are one which are just the text. They don't process it. So when it's executed, nothing happens to it. Most people don't use these very much, um, but they can be useful in certain situations when like you don't want it to execute something. So for example, if you were like demonstrating markdown, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, but let's start off by making a markdown cell so we can see sort of like the writing element. So to do that, just make sure you're in the cell and select markdown from the list here. Make sense? Okay, so in a markdown cell, you write in markdown. Markdown is a language. Um, it's a really basic markup language, which you have probably already used before. If you've ever used um, like old school forums, like um, like BB forums, if you ever used Instagram or Reddit, the markup that they use for formatting those kinds of fonts or text is markdown. 
Um, it renders to HTML and it does support a lot of HTML stuff as well. It's sort of, well, but let's take a look at kind of the, the basics here. So I want to make sure I cover the right things. Okay, so let's just type some stuff into our hello world. You'll notice ours has a spell checker involved as well, which is nice. So when I type into it, it looks like this. If I then go up to this little play button here, which is the run or execute button, if I click on it, it'll render that cell as text. In this case, it just looks like hello world, but you can get a lot more sophisticated. If I click back on this cell and then I double click on it, I'll go back into edit mode here. So the beauty of Markdown, and one of the reasons why it's so popular is that it's pretty easy to write basic, like standard human readable fonts and like our human readable text, but also include a lot of basic formatting options um, in a pretty straightforward and easy to remember way. And there's lots of good, I, I linked a couple of guides and stuff to Markdown if you wanna learn all the ins and outs of it. But for example, let's say we wanted to like give our notebook a title. Um, we can use hashtag, which it highlights in blue. I'll call this example notebook. Um, and now when I go up here and I click on run the cell, you'll see I get a, a heading here. And actually, if I go to my uh, table of contents, you'll now see I have a heading in my table of contents over here. All right. So headings, so your standard like H1, H2 headings that you would use in like, like Word or whatever are just more hashtags. So section one, markdown would just be two. And now you can see I got a section one markdown part and I can like pop around to the different parts of my notebook by clicking on them. Does that make sense? I think this supports up to six layers of these guys, but each one gets more and more. Boo -boo 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 -boo. Make sense? So heading is pretty straightforward. Um, okay, but like, what if you want some more text here? Like this is a notebook. Looks great, right? Um, also, you'll probably notice it's annoying clicking on the play button over and over again. You can hit shift enter or control enter and it'll run the, the cell you're currently in as well. Um, so, okay, what's another thing that we probably wanna do if we're formatting stuff? Does it automatically save? Uh, that's a great question. So if you look up in uh, under settings here, you'll see there's this auto save documents thing. Um, so if you go to settings, auto save documents, you can check that. I currently have it disabled because I don't like it auto saving my documents. Um, and then what it will do is every periodically, I don't know exactly how it determines it, but it will sort of periodically create checkpoints to, to automatically save stuff. But yeah. You can save, of course, if you are happy with your notebook so far, you can save it by going to the file menu and going save or good old control S. Make sense? So what's something else we would probably want to do if you're formatting something for students to read or something? Italics and stuff. Okay. So you want to make emphasis, you know, make text look different. Um, so this so is some text. Italics are pretty simple. They're just one star asterisk um, or underscores. That also works. But so for example, italics like this, it will preview kind of what it looks like. But if you go ahead and render that, it looks like proper italics without all like the weird code formatting. Um, another natural one is bolding. Bold text, okay. Bold text, alter font size, emphasis in bold. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get, let's see if we hit all these ones. Um, so bold text is two asterisks. Can you guess what three asterisks is? Oh, oh, I spelled it wrong. That's oh. pretty exciting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like the basics. Um, so those are kind of your basic formatting ones here. Um, let's do another one. Um, let's say you wanted to indent some text like in a particular way. For example, let's say you have like a long quote. You can use this if you put a, it's like the alligator mouth the, in like the, the dagger, it's, it's above the period on your keyboard if you're using a standard uh, US Canadian keyboard. Um, so if you use the, the caret, pointy uh, bracket, uh, Mm 
Um, it will produce uh, indented and extended text, which can be good for having sort of like call out elements or things like that that you kind of want to do. Um, okay, how about another thing that we all love and learn or love and use, uh, bullets. So if you put an asterisk at the very start of a line, it'll turn blue um, and this is a bullet. So for example, and when I render this, they show up as bullets. Um, to get indented bullets, so like second level bullets, just add two spaces, kind of like in Python, if you use Python. So you add two spaces or a tab, and then a, another bullet like this, it'll turn green. And this is like, say, level bullet. Oh, I can't spell bullet. And it'll look like this. Uh, uh, Rowan has a question, numbered bullets. You can probably guess, start of a line, a number one, and then a dot. We'll turn blue. Then number two. Number two. Now, one interesting thing, you can see this. I can't type. Eh. <laughs> You'll notice, if you take a look here, um, it'll keep the numbers in order. There's really no way to underline them. It just, it thinks they're all numbers here, which is kind of undesirable, but it's just the way that it does these things. So it, you can see it's like one, two, four. It thinks that they're numbered bullets, doesn't really care what the numbering is. So you, and it'll render as one, two, three, which is sometimes a little counterintuitive. Um, okay. So headings, fonts, bullets, quotations. Um, okay, let's, get a little bit more sophisticated. So often what we wanna do when we're showing students computational stuff is we'll need to show them uh, code. So like actual code that's not just like running, um, but that's actually here. You just saw it, if you looked at the bottom of my screen, it just saved my notebook. Um, there are two ways to do this. You can either do what's called inline code or you can do display mode code. So I'll show you inline code first. So in R, the... Uh, why? So let's say I wanted to refer to like a specific function. If you use the back tick key, which is on a standard keyboard where the tilde is above your tab, um, you get it's like monospace formatted. It'll look like this. Library function is important. And then when we render this, it'll show up as like monospaced kind of offset code elements. So this is often useful when you want to refer to something that's like a computational thing um, or like a, an object that you want to have that kind of monospace formatting. Um, so again, that's the back tick operation. Often when we have like chunks of code, we want to like set them up in a, like a, an environment that kind of like they set off from the rest of it. Um, you can do this with three of these back ticks. So tick, tick, tick like this, and then another three to close the environment. So like, here's my, let's type. It's like writing on the board, eh? Yeah, kind of. Um, and this will render, you can see it kind of pops off in an inset environment that, that looks like this. Um, some flavors will also, if you put a little parentheses here and then you put a bracket around it, may also recognize it as um, what type of language it is. So if you put parentheses and then the name of the language, um, some Jupyter hubs will format it, like it'll give it like colors and stuff, uh, syntax highlighting, um, but you don't have to do this, if that makes sense. So this one doesn't, but say it'll be. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? So those are like, I think the, I, this is like 99% of all of the coding that I do, in, or writing that I do. And what's great about this is that it's it's really easy to learn. Like you, you really don't have to learn any of this. Like it's almost second nature once you kind of get the, into the swing of things. Um, does it, yeah, it, it represents it like an indented snippet. That's that's right, Rowan. Um, okay, so I'm in, um, I'm in economics and we do a lot of math in economics. So math rendering is something that's really important for a lot of fields, not all fields, but let me show you how to do that. So similarly to this like monospace thing, there's two modes for math in this. Um, it's supported using a framework called MathJax, which is a very specific kind of LaTeX, if you know what that means. 
Um, so if you want to make inline map expressions, you use dollar signs, just like the back pick. So um, this is a map equation, map equation. So I put a dollar sign here and then I write like, and then I put another dollar sign and then it will highlight it. And right now it looks like garbage, but when you hit enter, it will, oops, mine is not showing up properly. Um, spaces, one sec. So if it doesn't change no, color, it's not showing up. There's something. Yeah. Why is my math not rendering properly? Okay, let's try the other one instead. Okay, that's better. Oh, why is my math not rendering properly? One sec. Hmm. I'll have to come back to this. I'm not sure. Anyway, this is the standard format for, for using your math expressions if you're doing these guys. Does yours work if you have yours? Yeah, give it a shot. I don't know. It might just be my renderer that that's up here. I don't know. I'm getting an unexpected symbol. Oh, yours is working actually. Okay, I don't know why mine is this one. Yeah, it's just it, it doesn't understand. You're in a code block here, so make sure you're in a markdown block. Ah, uh, yeah. Does yours work? Okay, so I don't know. Mine's being funky for reasons, whatever. Oh, it worked. Okay. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so I don't know why mine's being problematic right now. Maybe I'll make a new cell and see if it could work better here. Any tips, Prianchu, if you... Let's try here. There, okay, that worked better. I don't know why this one isn't working. But anyway. So we'll we'll do it here instead. So you can see if in my second markdown cell here, dollar signs, this is like an inline version. Inline code or inline math rather. This is inline math. Um, and then if you want to make a standoff equation, you can do like this is a display mode equation. You do two dollar signs um, like this on either side of this, and then you put in here like, uh, so also if you're familiar with LaTeX, um, LaTeX supports, this supports most standard LaTeX, like any of the AMS math or AMS SIM formats, which are like the standard LaTeX ones. So like, for example, you can do like, like pretty, you know, it doesn't support everything, but you can do like, you know, more complicated expressions. Don't worry about this if you don't know LaTeX, it's not a big deal. But like you can do like basic LaTeX expressions and stuff that looks this. I don't know why mine doesn't like working there. So it renders really nice thing. So math is important for many disciplines. So you can make it render nicely in math environments. This is quite important because often we want to sort of explain something or whatever, and, and you can do this. And students can also write this if they know LaTeX as well, which may be the case for more advanced students. Does that make sense? So LaTeX is another important one. You can embed math expressions into your thing. Um, you can also embed uh, images or uh, URLs. So let's do that in another cell down here. So I'll make a new cell for my... Um, why would you want to split stuff, stuff up across just in different cells? You can preview chunks more readily. I think it's probably the biggest one. So there are three different ways to use URLs when you're doing LaTeX or, or when you're doing uh, Jupyter rather. So like, let's say we wanted to link to ubc.ca. You can just do this. Like it, it will totally understand that and it will give you a link and that will work. If you want to be a little bit safer, in the sense of like you want it to make sure that it really knows it's a link, you can enclose it in um, like pointy brackets, and then you can do this instead. And it's gonna render exactly the same. In my case, it looks like this, but it'll render exactly the same. And it'll, it'll, it'll look the same as both of them. You can also do, um, if you put in the square bracket, then you put here, render it like this instead. 
So this is this is the most preferred way to do it is you either do it like this or like this. So this is like where you have the, um, the human readable version of this and then this is the URL. The reason this is preferred is because if people are using a screen reader, um, yeah, it's like for HTML code. Um, if you're using this, if, if your students are using screen readers, which is actually quite common, um, especially for students uh, with visual impairments or even students who are like English as a second language where they're using like something to help them read through, this provides like a more well, this will read better in their screen reader. So this will this will show up properly. Whereas this will just read out like www. Blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah, the second option is much more accessible. So this is strongly like preferred, this option, and you can, you know, Make it as spiffy or not as you want. Hello, hello. You have to catch up quickly. <laughs> um, okay. Um, you can also embed uh, images and other things. So in this, exactly the same way you embed URLs into your document, you can also embed um, different images into these things as well. So. In order to do this, however, you either need to have a URL to the image, that means it needs to be on the internet somewhere and you're gonna pass that URL to it, which is usually not a good idea unless you own it, or you need to upload it into your folder here. You go up here. So hard. Um, so we can see in our directory here, this is where all the files that are available. So when we want to embed or link to some other content, it actually needs to be on the internet somewhere that we can access, or it needs to be in our Jupyter folder here. Um, do you want me to get you started really quickly? Oh, no, I'm, is the Jupyter open? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're good, okay, cool. Um, so let, let me sort of show you. So let's suppose that we want to upload a picture from our computer here. So I'm gonna go to my, I'm gonna click on this upload button, wait one sec. So if you click on upload here in the finder or file browser, click on upload files, um, I've got a bunch of photos here. I'm going to pick this picture of a rock, which I like. Where is it? There. It's a very famous rock right off Point Grey, by the way. You should try to track it down. It has yeah. a name. It's a Um So when I do that, you'll see it loads up my, you can see the image is now in the list of folders that I have here. So now it's accessible to me through this particular website. All right, so now it's on my hub, and now I can include this directly into my thing by referencing the path to that image. Um, so to do this, let me go make a, oops, that's my website. If I go here, I'm gonna make another markdown cell. Um, images formats are exactly the same as uh, URLs. So what you do, uh, or there's one small difference, you put an exclamation point to tell it that it's a, a file, you put two square brackets and then two open brackets. In the square brackets, you type the alt text or like the caption for the image. at UVC. And then in the uh, non square brackets, you put the path to this particular file relative to the current notebook you're working in. So in this case, it's in the same direct directory as me. So I would just put jpeg here. But if this was like somewhere else on the internet, you would paste like the URL to that particular image or something. So if I then hit control enter, it'll load the image in. It's like this. So let's like go grab, you know, if I uh, go to like UBC's homepage, and I like find a random photograph that I want to steal <laughs> and I copy the image address, you can do basically the same thing here. We have this image here, and this will also work. The reason you wouldn't want to do this is that if someone else moves this object or they change the permissions for this object, it's going to break your uh, your notebook. Or it's not going to break it, but it'll show up as a little like missing image image instead. What's the use of the caption? The use of the captions the alt text. Uh, yeah. So this is the alt text. Yeah. So this is the alt text. Yeah. So it doesn't show up directly underneath the image. 
But when a student is using a screen reader or something, it'll show up um, as like the caption for that particular image, which is important. Yeah, so that looks like, uh, Rowan, it looks like you were running the cell in the, um, in, in a code cell, not a markdown cell. So for instance, I think I can duplicate your error if I go like, you have to make sure you're in a, in a, in a, in a, in a markdown cell, because if I do this, it's going to explode. All right, I have to be in a markdown cell. You're going to get the bomb. No, this guy here, markdown. And that'll work. Although this is not going to link anywhere. Does that make sense? So images, embedding, pretty good. Okay. Um, let's move on to the next major cell type. We got about a half an hour, so we're, we're doing good on time. So that's like the authoring part. So as I said, this is part of the computational or literate computation framework. And that you, what you do is you weave together, uh, you know, content, and then you also weave that together with code, with the idea that the two kind of cross talk with one another. So you, you, it's sort of like super commenting, if you remember, if you think about like a standard code file, but something that's a lot more accessible because you can kind of, you know, interact with them. So if we make a new cell here underneath it, we want, we'll want we make this a code cell instead. Um, you can tell it's a code cell because it'll have this little square next to it in addition to saying code at the top. Um, this is the kernel execution count, which I'll, I'll talk about here. So code cells are a little bit different than markdown cells in the sense that they what they are doing when you run these is rather than just rendering them, they are gonna render the output. What they do before they produce the output is they send the commands or whatever's inside that cell to the kernel that you are currently connected to. So this needs to be in whichever language we're using here. So we're connected to R, so we can use any standard R commands that we can run on this kernel. So for example, we could, you know, get it to do some basic computation. So one plus one, and then when we, you know, hit run, what it's gonna do, this will happen really quickly. So just watch here, you'll see, this will briefly turn gray as it processes the computation. And then it, the, this will increment, telling us what order this was run in. So it'll be the first cell that was run, and then it will produce the output underneath it. So let's just try that if I hit here. So it was super fast because one plus one is a very quick computation. Um, and you'll see here, this will say, you know, this is the third cell I've executed here on this current kernel. Um, and it will spit out in this bottom part here. So you can see that was the cell and this is the output, um, the, the result of my computation. So if you're using a different language, this would hopefully work in your language because it probably can compute one plus one, but, um, every language is gonna be a little bit different in the syntax that they use for these things. Does that make sense? And this is really where the beauty of Jupyter Notebooks comes in because this is just like having a computer, like a, a computer on that you're accessing where you have a connection to the R language. So you can do anything in the R language that you would do more generally. So, or whatever language you're using, you know, Python, C, Sage, Math, whatever, it can compute any of these things. So you basically have access to a fully functional computational environment, which means anything you or an RA or someone else on the internet who can program into it can, can run this on this, which gives you basically unlimited scope to create different kinds of visualizations, interactivity, things like that. Um, there's, there's just, enormous ranges for what you can do and, and how you can do it. Um, I'll point out a couple of common ones that people use a lot. So for example, like Plotly is a really popular framework. Um, yeah, so one thing Rowan points out here, code and markup are mutually exclusive. So they're different cell types. So although you can add comments in here, just like you would in regular R codes, so I'll put a pound side, a comment, that will be fine. Um, this isn't gonna render as markup. Right now, it will process the output as well as it can. Um, so it tries to do it sort of as intelligently as possible. So I'll show you a couple examples here. So you know, maybe let's do a more sophisticated code cell. So I'm going to load the tidyverse library, which looks like this, and then I'm going to think this is the way to do it. I think this should work. Oh, there's no. Time. And you can put typos 
Um, this is also really good for teaching people to, to code because you can see all the, you know, it'll just get perfectly computed objects here. So you can see what I did here is I, when I, I made a typo first and then, so what I've done here is I've loaded the tidyverse package and it's spitting out the, the output. And then I've also created a data object here, which is, um, this is a standard package in many computational languages called the iris data set. And it's like a bunch of flowers, irises. Um, and then we can, you know, if you wanted to look at, if you wanted to look at the iris data set, we could, you know, uh, we could look at, uh, let's do this head of iris here. We could do head iris here. And we've got this thing that looks like this. Um, and you'll notice it, it kind of tries to render these as well as it can, right? So you can provide it with other post processors and stuff that you want to use within your, your, your tool set here. Um, but now we can pretty much do anything we want with this. You can compute computational stuff. You can, you know, uh, just gonna make a quick graph here. Iris goals cpal dot. Don't worry about this if you are coding along at home. Do whatever you want. Y equals cpal dot width. Uh, color equals species. I can do oops, and I need to not oh, okay, it worked. Now I just have to display it. Ta da! The point is, I'm not going to, you know go over our coding because you can learn whatever you want, right? The point is this has access to all the underlying functionality of whatever language you're working in. So you can kind of dump anything you want into these notebooks. And moreover, this might look really intimidating to students, but you can also encapsulate these in other you know, helper commands to make things more accessible to students depending on the level at which the students are kind of at in their particular you know, learning or whatever. Um, and there are many, you know, interactive frameworks that people have in different languages. So, for example, in Python and R, Plotly is kind of designed for this thing where you have, you can create like interactive visualizations that kind of look like this. There's lots of different options for this. But the point is, if you can program it or you can get an RA to program it, you can put it into a notebook and you can make it accessible to students. Does that make sense? Um, so it's it's very, very powerful because you have access to pretty much anything you want. This also gives you the option to do kind of clever stuff that you otherwise might not be um, immediately able to do within a sort of standard um, markdown language. So for example, embedding videos is something that we often want to do. Um, and you can do this using the computational tool that you have where you can have it render the video as, as HTML output and then it'll render it. So I'll just show you there, it's in the, oh, actually, this is like our Thank you, Yeah. So I'll sort of show you the. I always forget the code for this one, so I always have to look it up. So, for instance, if we want to, let's say we wanted to embed like a YouTube video or something here. So, I have an example for both Python and R. So, for R, you would do this IR display. One colon display underscore HTML. And then in this bracket here, I'm going to go to YouTube really quickly. I'm going to grab a video. Um, yeah, so uh, Rowan asks, are code cell, are errors in code sentences highlighted? It depends on what language you're using. Um, you'll notice over here, there's a little debugger. Um, different, some kernels have debuggers associated with them. R doesn't, um, but Python does. So it depends a lot on, um, it does basic syntax highlighting. So you can see here it does syntax highlighting, but it doesn't do on the fly debugging unless you enable the debugger for that particular one. So it's it's really not like, it, yeah, it anyway, depends on what you're doing. So let's go to like YouTube, UBC. Okay, hey, welcome back to UBC, sweet. I'm gonna grab here, uh, share. You can do it. I believe in you. Please load. 
let's try that again. Why is YouTube the point of failure here? Again, let's try another video. Okay. Why? Why are you like this? King. Yeah. Maybe. Let me try hard refreshing this. Well, what I need is the embed code for the for the video from from YouTube here. Let me try again. It should just be under their share button, but YouTube doesn't want to load here. Okay, let me try this. Uh, YouTube embed code. Okay. Uh, let me go here. I just wanted an example, please. Damn it. Um, I'm kind of stuck if I don't have an embed code. Anyway, the point is you can just dump in this particular embed code into here. One sec, let me move it over here and I'll try to fix this. If anyone online has an embed code, if you can dump it in the chat, Prianchu, that would actually be a solution here. If you can help me out. Thank you, Andrea, or, or, and George. Okay, let's grab this guy here. Uh, thank you, much appreciated. Uh, so I'm just gonna grab Andrea's example here. I'm gonna copy it. Then I'm gonna go back to my <coughs> example here. Then we just enclose inside the brackets here in quotation marks. Um, okay, now the one thing you have to do, you'll notice it doesn't look like it's uh, it's all highlighted in red. One thing you have to do is you have to um, you have to escape the uh, the other quotation marks like inside the embed code. So you can see this is like the one that we're using in our code block, um, but then it thinks that like the embed is ending here. So what you need to do is you need to put a forward slash in front of all those. Oops in front of all the ones that shouldn't. Can you just do a single quote for the only one? Can I? I'm not sure. That would be... Usually you can. So if you do the... Let me try it. R can do both single quote and so you can... Okay, so it's very to respond with a single. I'm learning something new, hopefully. Let's try that. And then... Oh, game changer. That's so much better. Thank you. Thanks. Um, or you can escape them as well. Well, let's hope this yeah. works. Yeah, it worked. Okay, sweet. Now we have a nice little video here. Great. Oh, uh, Andrea, so he was saying um, our support, so what was your name? Stefan. Stefan. Um, he was saying that you can, it supports both single and double quotes. So in our, uh, I didn't know this actually, so this is awesome. Um, you can do like both of these, or you can embed it in a single quote and then it won't like, it, they won't interfere with one another. So both of them are recognized. So what I did here, if you if you look, I enclosed the embed string in single quotes because it has these double quotes inside it, which otherwise I would have to escape. Yeah. So that's good. I learned that. It's awesome. All right. Um, yeah. So you, you can embed other stuff as well. So if you use like H5P content, yeah. Um, you can use like H5P content, anything that you can embed kind of, you can, you can do this. In Python, it's actually even easier because you can just do HTML. There's like an HTML magic you can process in Python, but R doesn't support that. Um, okay, so that's sort of like, I think the big picture, like most important elements for these, but let's talk a little bit about like student use and encapsulation because one of the things that we want to do when we're producing notebooks for student use or in teaching contexts is there's stuff that we want students to focus on and there's stuff that we don't want students to focus on when they're when they're doing something. So for example, um, this happens a lot in, in some of my things is we often work with real world data like data from the Canadian census or something. And that data often in order to get it to sort of the point that student where we get to the concept we wanna be understanding requires a bunch of like pre-processing or cleanup or, or something, right? And you could, you know, have your first cell be like this gigantic monster cleanup cell, that is fine. The problem you face is that you probably don't want students to see that. Um, another thing you can do is you can also have um, these, 
cells here, your code cells, since they're interactive, you can make them self-tests or self-assessments. So for example, if I had like, let's make a markdown cell here and we say, what is the capital of capital of Canada? Right, and then you could say, you know, A, I guess like A, Ottawa, B, Toronto, I can't type properly. This is always the hazards of typing in front of other people. C, Vancouver, let me fix that indentation here. So you, you could do something like this. You could make questions, or they could be coding questions too, you know, like what's the mean of you know, what's the mean sepal length or something? You know, you can you can make questions, but then because this is interactive, you could have students say, you know, you could then tell them, you know. Right, or you can put like a question mark here. Answer. Right. So you can have something like this and you can have the students as they work through the notebook, fill these in. But moreover, you can also write a helper function that you know tests this particular answer. So for instance, if we make a function in R, which is like, let's call it, uh, so we're like, uh, test, Test one uh, equals, I don't know, oh, test one, thank you. So I'm just making this, and you can, you know, whatever you want to do inside your function. So I can do like if answer, answer equals A, success, you know, else. Oops. <coughs> now you could do something like this and then you could have the answer down below. You could have them run, you know, Right. So you can do this. And then when the students are working through the notebook, they can, you know, fill in the thing. And then when they run the test, it'll tell them whether they got it right or wrong and stuff like that. Does that make sense? So you can write interactive self-test. Now, of course, there's some obvious problems here. So the first one is, again, that issue with encapsulation. You probably don't want to show students the code that runs the tests in the notebooks. So the way to do this is to create a helper file. So if you go over here, and make like you know, a new file. So I'm going to call it tests.r. So it'll be an R file. I can hold R files. And then I open it up here. And I've got an R command. I can you know, move the code I don't want students to see here into my tests.r file and then save it. Um, or if this is Python tests.py or, or whatever. Um, and then if I go here, you can load it in R, it's the source command, source tests.r. So here. Okay. Um, and now if I run this, it should still work, right? And now, and you can put this somewhere at the very start of your notebook. We usually have like a setup cell that we run at the very beginning of each notebook. And now this has encapsulated this as well. But you could equivalently do it for anything you don't kind of don't want the students to see. So you could replace this with like show video one. And it's just a function that just shows the video instead of like 
all the, because it can look kind of, students, especially students who are very getting started with code are often very intimidated when there's stuff that they don't understand. So encapsulating stuff by creating little helper functions and hiding them is, is quite useful. You also notice that the logic of these helper functions can be as sophisticated or as, um, you know, rudimentary as you want. So for instance, you can like, you can incorporate sort of uh, simple, correct, incorrect answers. You can um, automatically correct things like capitalization and, and stuff like that. You can, you can do a lot of that sort of like processing of the, the, the elements in these particular things. Uh, and this is really, really great because as students work through the notebooks or you work through with them, you can kind of have like points where you stop, you check in and you test your knowledge as you're going through, right? And they can be something like this, or they could be, you know, um, code-based as well, you know, like. Right, and then you could have like, you know, um, You can have a cell that they're supposed to fill in here, and then you could write a test that tests whether they've got, you know, um, the correct sepal length here. Does that make sense? Um, so, what's a sort of obvious problem if you're trying to use these for formative assessment? Do you think what might be a problem with this? They could look at the testing of our files. Yeah, exactly. Like we have to provide students with these files so that they can actually run them and they can just look at the answers. And that's not really great because I mean, this may be fine. If you don't really care about that, that's okay. But often you really want students to work a little bit on the answers because, you know, especially if, the, if you're getting them to hand this in for homework or something, even just for completion, it's way easier to just like go through the answers and just fill in all the correct answers than to actually, you know, bother going through it. So how can you kind of handle this or what's a sort of like approach to handling this? Um, there are several different ways to do it. The easiest and probably the most straightforward way is to lean on the magic of cryptography, um, in particular using one-way hash functions. So a hash function in cryptography is something that takes an input usually rendered in, in bytecode or something, and it computes a function of that input, which spits out a string, a piece of text, that's very, very hard to kind of go back to the input. That's why they're called one-way hash functions. They're used for stuff like storing passwords on computer systems and stuff. Um, you never store actual people's passwords, you store the hashes of them. The idea of a hash function is that it's really easy to verify that someone got the correct hash, but very difficult if you have the correct hash to work out what would have generated that. So this can kind of, the, this, can provide you the way to kind of solve this problem here. So let's say like, you know, we, we the answer is A, but we really don't want to show them that the answer is A, right? We don't want them to be able to peek at this. So in R, um, I provide in the notes a couple of different options. We can use the, the digest function. So if I go library digest, then I do digest, I'm gonna do the answer here. Can't spell properly. Die just a. Um, what we'll see here, I'll show you. Oops, I can't spell. So what it does with this digest function, what it does is it takes in this input, and it can actually be any R object, although it's usually um, best practice to test sort of the minimal correct answer, um, the one that's like the least prone to any sort of uh, uh, like manipulation by students. Uh, so, and so you can see it produces this big string here instead. And this is the hashed value of A. And you can see, you know, even if I, you know, if I pop in a different value like B here, right, we get a completely different output. Right. And so the idea is that rather than in your tests.r function, we'll just let's what we'll do is we'll load that, that library. And rather than testing whether the answer is equal to A, we'll test if digest of the answer is equal to this guy here, this string here. 
get over here. Make sense? So if I save this, then I go back here and delete those guys. I don't need them anymore. Um, should work, I'll, I'll get a success, but if I put in anything else like B, which is the wrong answer, I'll get a whoops instead, right? And the students can't peek at the answer because it's just a big string of cryptologically secure uh, information that, that goes into it. Now, one thing to be a little bit cognizant of when you are doing this, if you're developing these notebooks in particular and you, know, you kind of put them in, um, you have to be somewhat sensitive about what you are asking students to put in. You, you have to be careful about this, either by handling common mistakes that would compile incorrectly or by being very clear in your instructions for students. Because for example, if I put in capital A, it's gonna be wrong, right? The reason is, if you look at, you look at, you know, the digest of A and the digest of little a, those numbers, the, the hashes of those are very different because although they're very similar characters, hashes try to not put similar things into similar hashes. So they're not gonna collide. So you have to be very careful that you are actually, you know, what the answers they're providing are exactly what the correct answer should be because there's really no, no way for them to figure out what this unless you provide some guidance for common mistakes and stuff like that. This also extends to if you test more complicated R objects, uh, like for example, computations or things, anything that includes sort of arbitrary student generated text or input, like the name of a data frame or the name of a variable is gonna be a problem because that's a different object. So for instance, like if you make a data frame that looks like, You look at a data frame that looks like this, and then a data frame that looks like this. All right, like logically, like from a human perspective, those are the same objects, right? They just have a different name for one of the variables, right? But if you do the digest of that data frame, oops. Uh, If you do the digest of that data frame and then you do the digest of the other data frame, you get completely different results. So you have to be somewhat careful in exactly what you are testing if you can use this method of obfuscating the, uh, the inputs for these. Does that make sense? So hopefully at this point, we, you've got a good sense of like how to build a basic notebook and some of the basic you know, ways and the tools and objects that you can use. As I mentioned, um, at the end of this, uh, this sheet here, I have a bunch of examples of different pedagogical approaches people have taken across a number of different fields and sort of different styles of notebooks, different use cases, which I think to be honest is probably the the best way of kind of learning about what you can do and what you might do. But as I said, the sky's really the limit for this. So the final thing I wanted to talk about was, yes. I just have a question on the hashing. So the yeah. digest, it creates this uh, code locally that then like, yeah. it's mapping, but if a student uses digest on their own computer, it won't produce the same code. It will. So it's the input, well, is, as long as the input is the same, it'll produce exactly the same code. But you cannot use it backwards. So yeah, but if, if I gave you this code, you would never be able to figure out what produced that code. But if they know the option for like A, B, and C, they could yeah. digest A and not get it. Yes, eventually. But at that point, they could just guess all the four options. <laughs> um, That's true. Yeah. Because if they have unlimited attempts, you know, you can solve any problem with enough brute force. So, but it prevents basically brute force attempts that don't exhaust all the options. Um, okay, uh, could I share what, uh, so what, what are you talking about, Rowan? What, what, um, oh, the, the digest code? Oh, uh, yeah, it's it's um, in the, one sec. Give me just one sec, I'll drop it in the chat. It's, it's right here. Um, okay. Okay, so let's talk about how we can share these with students now. Um, this is often the, the last sort of the final mile to 
actually using these in the, in the classroom. Um, there are basically two options. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on them today because they're fairly self-explanatory, but they're also somewhat um, idiosyncratic to your particular situation. The first and the most straightforward way to do this is, um, so when you're using these in the classroom, what you do is you just download, you put these in a folder, you download all your notebooks onto your computer, you upload them to Canvas as a file, the folder, you just tell students to upload them to their own hub when you're ready to do this. This is the advantage of being super straightforward and that you basically have to do nothing. You just put them together, you put them on your Canvas site, download, upload, that's it, um, which is good. Um, the downside of that, of course, is that you have to do that, which means, you know, if you make changes or something, you, uh, uh, you, oh, one sec. There. Um, you have this sort of like, it's, it's not the smoothest way to do stuff, right? You, you, you would presumably like a, a better way to do this. So the other option is to use GitHub. Um, so if you're familiar with GitHub, GitHub is a hosting service produced by Microsoft, primarily for sharing code in different environments. Um, the great thing about this is that what you can do is you can make a really, really basic GitLab repos or GitHub repository and then upload your notebooks and all the materials there in sort of an organized way. And then you can provide students with what's called an NB Git puller link, or what it does is it goes to your public GitHub account with the repository with all your files, it grabs them, and then it loads them into the hub of your choosing. Um, so you can actually try this. I'll show you on the Comet website if you are so inclined. If you look here at our Comet, oops, it's on the wrong web screen here. So if you look here at our Comet website, at the top, we have this launch Comet button, which if you click on, has a bunch of options for where you can launch it. Uh, if you look down in the bottom here, <laughs> See this bottom? This is an NB Git puller link. So all this really does is it sends a command to your hub to pull from my repository where I've got all these notebooks living, all of these particular objects. So let me show you what this looks like from the, set, from the setup side of things. So if we go to my GitHub account, so you go to GitHub, um, here's my GitHub. Uh, actually, I want my public one. This one. Uh, okay, so if you look here, we've got this little super basic Git, GitLab, GitHub repository where basically what we've done is we've just uploaded all of our notebooks. You can see them, they're all sort of organized into folders here. So you just make a GitHub repository and then you upload the folders and files that you would like to share with your students. So you can see many of these examples also in some of the, the examples here, but all you do like bottom line is you just make a repository and then you upload your files here. It doesn't actually require you to know anything about Git, which is kind of nice because that may be a, a step too far for people who are just getting started. So make an account, upload your files here, and then here's, you can generate a link through NB Git folder. You go here, um, you can read the documentation to it as well, but it's pretty straightforward. What you do basically is you, um, you plug in the URL of the hub you want to launch the student's notebooks on. So in this case, it would be Jupyter Open if you're having students use Jupyter Open. You drop in the repository URL for your particular one. You choose the branch, which is usually main on new ones or master on older ones. And then you select uh, Jupyter Lab as the environment that it would produce. So for instance, if I grab like my GitHub link here, and I paste it in here. That's my guy here. My branch is, is main. Then I go and I grab the uh, Jupyter Hub URL. So you can see it's here, copy the link address. And I paste that here. Um, and then I click here, you'll see it has this like kind of slick, it produces this long, long URL, but this is basically what you would click on to do this. And you can kind of see if you go back to the Comet web page, I have it to launch on different hubs because people might want to launch on other ones. 
So if I click on launch on Jupyter Open, which you can try, it'll do this thing, it'll synchronize the repository, so it'll go boom, 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 and then it'll load it up here. And you can see here, there's a little folder. This is the student looking version. And you can see it, it should load this Comet project folder, which now has all these notebooks inside it for your own. And students can refresh this. So if you like make changes or something, you can just say, Re please reload the repository and then it'll, it'll do stuff like this. Does that make sense? So this basically copies the notebooks from them. And it's basically one click, um, which is nice. But as I said, there are other deployment options because the one downside of it being on GitHub is the fact that it lives in the open, right? Although it's still copyrighted, you can make, you know, you don't have to distribute using an open license. It's still going to be on the internet and people can copy and download stuff. And you may not want that if you're sharing sense, something that might be sensitive or something that you don't really want just sort of floating around in the uh, AI ether out there. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, that is it for our session today. Um, I'm going to call the formal presentation part right now. Um, but if you do have any questions, I'm going to hang around for like another 15 minutes or so. Um, if you have any questions or anything, um, I hope this was useful. If you want any help with, you know, setting up your own notebooks. Um, yeah, Andrea, I'll, I'll put together some step-by-step uh, -step guide to doing the NB Git Puller thing. And I'll, I'll send it to you guys after the session. Is that something we can do? Yeah, we'll send a, I'll send a, an updated link to the resources.